and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn series. I'm Sydney Ross, the Outdoor Education Manager with Deep Roots, and we have a fabulous show for you today. But before we begin, I have a couple announcements to make. And while I get this pulled up, here we go. Perfect. Okay. So as I mentioned, we have a wonderful show for you today, uh, A Delicate Weave, Keystone Species and the Web of Life, brought to you by Deep Roots and the Mid-America Regional Council. So thank you for Mark's support with this particular program. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors. In addition to Mark, uh, we have the Missouri Department of Conservation, who supports our Lunch and Learn series, as well as Native Plants at Noon and other programs. I really appreciate their support and encouragement to get people outdoors to appreciate nature. And I appreciate viewers like you for joining in. We create this educational content just for you because we care about what you plant. And as you know, what you plant matters. You may be aware of the exciting Planet Native Conference coming to Kansas City on February 15th and 16th. Uh, we will be at the Discovery Center and Kauffman Foundation and tickets are selling out. We only have about 40 left. So if you're planning on getting your ticket, be sure to do so today. Um, and if this triple threat of keynote speakers doesn't uh, set your appetite a flare, um, including Roy Diblick, who I've talked about several times. He wrote the No Maintenance Landscape book uh, to, to tell you how to work with your plants in nature. Um, and also Neil DeBull and Desiree Narongo. Um, and if you're a big fan of Doug Tallamy's, Desiree is one of his, um, uh, he, she, rather she has worked with him uh, closely um, and has lots of insight about homegrown national park and the value of adding native plants to your own landscape. And one more thing on planet native, um, if you if that isn't enough to whet your appetite, we also have a wonderful exhibitors hall that will be located in the lobby of the Discovery Center. And I wanna do a quick shout out to some of our sponsors who will be presently exhibiting. We have Izell Native Plants, Missouri Department of Conservation, Horace Keeling, Missouri Wildflower Nursery, Taylor Creek, Deep Roots, Leaf and Sky, Mark, and at the Deep Roots booth, I want to mention we have these brand new, hot off the press, native plant signs. So if you have been wanting to add uh, some interpretive signage to your garden to show your neighbors and community members that you are uh, you care about what you plant and you're wanting to support wildlife with beautiful blooms. You you can purchase these uh, during the conference at the Deep Roots booth located in the lobby of the Discovery Center on February 15th and 16th. So be sure to get your tickets. Like I said, we're about to sell out. So I'd love to see you all there. All right. And of course, uh, for more information about our upcoming events, webinars, and resources, you can visit us online. All of our webinars in the past are archived on there as well as YouTube. And while you're there, consider making a donation to continue our educational efforts. All right, and before we get this uh, film started, I wanna just do a quick introduction because Sarah Beyer, um, a good friend of mine, has created this presentation and you are absolutely going to love it. Uh, so you may be wondering, uh, or you may be familiar with keystone species, but essentially keystone species are the MVP or most valuable players in our food web. And without them, the rest of our natural world ecosystems could not survive without them. So Sarah Beyer, um, who is a former alum, uh, or rather an alum of Deep Roots, you may know them, um, but they grew up exploring plants and their attendant wildlife in the wooded plains of northeastern Kansas. And they spent their earliest formative years in a small cabin outside of Topeka, where they formed an affinity for trail walking and bug catching. 
They earned their Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology from Missouri State University in 2006 and has been engaged in the world of science and education ever since. In 2016, they answered a help wanted message in an email newsletter and found themselves serving as Jill of all trades for Kansas City Native Plant Initiative, now known as Deep Roots. After five wonderful years with the Native Plant, with our Native Plant nonprofit, they opened Oak and IO, serving the Kansas City area as a native landscape designer, consultant, and educator. Without further ado, please enjoy this this episode of Lunch and Learn about keynote species. Hey everybody, my name is Sarah Beyer. I'm excited to be here with you today. Um, I'm a native landscape designer, educator, and consultant here in the Kansas City area. Today's Lunch and Learn webinar was originally recorded as part of a cooperative project between Deep Roots and Mid-America Regional Council. Uh, the episode you'll see today is entitled A Delicate Weave, Keystone Species and the Web of Life. This keystone species concept is so important to me and to the way that I think about what I do for a living uh, that I named my company in honor of it. Over the next half hour, I hope to deepen your understanding of the necessity, the value, and the unique beauty of native landscaping. Uh, we're going to explore a series of interconnected relationships with some of our most valuable keystone species as the foundation. Um, as you listen, if this is something that you find resonates with you and you want to learn more about how to implement it, I hope you'll join me in person at the upcoming Planet Native Conference on February 15th and 16th, where I'll be presenting a session on garden design with keystone species uh, to help you take the information you'll learn today and to apply it in your yard in ways that make ecological and aesthetic sense. So uh, without a whole lot more ado, let's dive right in. I wanna start off our discussion today by sharing this quote with you. Uh, John Muir said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. I think this is just a really lovely way to describe the interwovenness of nature, um, where each individual is both affecting its community and its surroundings and is affected by its community and its surroundings, um, and just all of the interconnected relationships. I, I think nowhere is this more evident than when we look at the concept of keystone species um, and find that just each relationship gives way to another relationship, to another relationship, to another relationship, um, kind of spreading out like a spider web. So I want to explore some of these strands with you today. Um, we'll start with a couple of definitions, uh, just so that we have a shared language today. Um, as a reminder from our earlier episode, a keystone species is one which has a disproportionately large effect on its natural environment relative to its abundance. So every animal and plant that you see here on your screen is a keystone species. They're not always plants, um, but that's what we'll focus our talk on today. And then another couple of words that we'll use a lot today uh, that I thought it was worth reviewing um, is, first of all, a species. Um, species is a group of organisms made up of similar individuals that are capable of interbreeding or exchanging genes. And then a genus is a classification that includes closely related species. The plural of genus is genera, and we'll also use that word today as we talk about our three keystone genera. So when we want to determine whether a group of plants or a, a genus of plants is a keystone, um, there's two criteria that we'll take a look at. First, um, we look at support for pollinators and specifically for support of specialist pollinators. So specialist pollinators are those that collect pollen from just a limited number of species. It might be just one or two species. It might be one or two genera. It might be just one family of plants, but they can't pollinate just any flower they come across. Generalist pollinators, on the other hand, can pollinate just about any flower they come across. So um, they collect pollen from many different types of plants, including our keystone species. Um, so keystones are a good food source 
both for the generalist pollinators, but also have those very specialized relationships with specialist pollinators that are really important to supporting the ecosystem. The second thing we're looking at is Lepidoptera. Now that's the name for the group that includes both butterflies and moths. And we wanna know how many species of Lepidoptera use the plant as a host for their caterpillars. We talked about host plant relationships in our previous episodes, and you may remember that this is very important for songbirds, um, and we'll revisit that concept uh, along the way today. Keystones may be providing food beyond that host plant role though. Um, they provide shelter and protection. Um, keystone species are ecosystems unto themselves. If you remember, an ecosystem is a community of organisms interacting with each other and with their environment. And as we continue through our example genera today, I want to sort of draw your attention to these interactions um, and to the chain of relationships they support. Um, many of these relationships I hope are new and interesting to you. So let's take a kind of side detour here um, and talk quickly about how do I find out which keystone genera are important in my area? So for this, I'm going to refer you to the resources that accompany this webinar, where you will find a link to this section of the National Wildlife Federation's website. So once you get to this page, you'll be able to view a map and discover your ecoregion. An ecoregion is an area of general similarity in ecosystems. So the plants and animal communities that are found in these areas tend to be more similar within the area um, than they are when compared with the communities outside the area. Um, and again, these are just really broad strokes. Um, there are also subregions um, as part of this. So if you want to dig into that, there's some additional information and in resources as well. Uh, but for our purposes today, we're just going to look at these really broad swaths of the continent. Um, so if you're here in the Kansas City area, you can see that we're in that kind of peachy uh, region, number nine. Uh, and then if you look over to the left, uh, you can see that that's called the Great Plains region. If you're tuning in from southeastern Missouri, um, then you're in the eastern temperate forests. Um, if you live really close to a boundary, um, then you may want to pay attention to both of these. And there's surely going to be a lot of overlap as well. Um, so this is just kind of a helpful way to divide up the landscapes uh, in terms of similarity. And so once you've figured out which eco region you live in, you'll select from the links. Um, there on the left is a screenshot of the website. So you can see, you can both look at the map and you can um, select from the different eco regions. And once you do so, you'll get this two page PDF that contains top keystone plant genera for your eco region. Um, it's divided up by trees, shrubs, flowering perennials. Um, the second page also breaks it down for top keystone genera for specialist pollinators, top keystone genera for Lepidoptera. Um, and so a couple of different ways to kind of um, pick this information apart um, and see how many species in your general region rely on the various genera. Remember, if you would like to research the species within a genus, you can search for it using BONAP, the Biota of North America project. Um, and I'll have a link to this in the resources as well. So um, you would search for, in this case, Acer. This is the genus of the maples. And so you get all of these various maps that show you for each species those bright green counties are the counties where it is recorded. The green states are states in which it has been recorded. Um, and then there's some other information as well if you want to dive into like the pinks and the blues. Um, if you click on that map color key, um, you can decode what all of that information uh, means. But just for our kind of general purposes today, wanted to refresh your memory about how to use this page. The first keystone group we're going to talk about today is the oaks. So the Latin name for the oak genus is Quercus. There are 76 species of oaks native to North America. Worldwide, the genus is divided into subcategories. So there's kind of five subcategories worldwide. Locally here in Kansas and Missouri, we predominantly just have two of those subgroups, the white oaks and the red or sometimes called black oaks. A couple of key differences between the groups, the white oaks have rounded lobes on the leaves. So that's that first picture there on the left. Um, and the red oaks have 
uh, pointed tips on the ends of their lobes. White oaks grow more slowly and have rougher bark. Red oaks tend to grow more quickly and have smoother bark. And there's some differences um, that you can delve into as well um, between the way the acorns grow when they germinate um, and, and several other characteristics that can um, give you some more information about these groups. Of course, we have many important economic species in the genus. We use oak for all sorts of things, for woodworking and construction. And Quercus is the single most important keystone group in terms of Lepidoptera, so the butterflies and the moths. If you're familiar at all with Doug Tallamy's work, and we'll talk about that as we go along as well, um, you know that, uh, that he's done some extensive research on how many Lepidoptera species are supported by this genus um, and others that are valuable in the area as well. So as a keystone group, Quercus doesn't provide benefits for pollinators really. Um, oaks are wind pollinated, so they don't have any specialist pollinators. They don't produce nectar. Um, but where they really shine is the Lepidoptera. So over 550 species uh, across North America rely on oaks as uh, either their only or one of their host plants. Uh, locally here in the Great Plains region, we have over 250 species. Um, and as I said, more than any other genus. So this is a really important group to include in our conversation and an important group to include in our landscapes. One of the creatures that relies on oak that I'd like to talk about a bit is the Io moth. Um, so if you don't recall, here is kind of a quick overview of the life cycle of a caterpillar using the Io moth as an example. So in the top uh, left photo there, we have the eggs, very, very small, um, attached in this case in a group to the leaf. Um, when the caterpillars hatch out of the leaves, Io moths are what we call gregarious caterpillars. They live in a large group, um, especially when they're small, they follow each other around the leaves. Um, and then as they grow, they often go through changes in um, the way that they look, changes in their color. Um, and in this case, they also become more solitary. And the, the life stages that a caterpillar goes through as it grows are called instars. Um, and many moths or butterflies have five or six instars between the egg and um, going through metamorphosis into an adult. So in the bottom left picture here, we have an older instar of the Io moth caterpillar. Um, and then once it has completed all of its growth that it's going to do as a caterpillar, it forms a cocoon. Um, and the way that it does that is to um, wrap silk attached to leaves, to fallen leaves. Um, and so that middle bottom photo there are actually two uh, cocoons of the Io moth. So if you remember when we talked about supporting ecosystems on your property, one of the things that we talked about with that was leaving the leaves. Um, and this is just such a good example of why that's important. If you didn't know, you know, to look for it, um, or even if you did know to look for it, uh, this is really difficult to pick out that there's anything special um, about these leaves. Um, and it looks like something that most folks would just like sweep into a bag or rake up and maybe set out a set out at the curb. So um, if you do that, though, you're missing out on this gorgeous Io moth. That's the um, final picture there um, is a photo of the male Io moth. Um, and just out of hundreds of eggs that the female lays, we have just a few that are making it to adulthood in every generation. Um, and the reason for that is that many of them end up right here in the mouths of baby birds. As a genus, Quercus is host to some really interesting species like the Io moth and others, um, but also to hundreds of kind of nondescript um, little brown moths. Um, if you're a birder or have been around birders, you might be familiar with the term LBBs or little brown birds. Um, just uh, small, kind of nondescript, can be really difficult to tell apart, especially at a distance. Um, so uh, the, the mothers have it too. So it's the LBMs, the little brown moths. Um, and Quercus feeds hundreds of these species. Um, a handful of them are dependent exclusively on Quercus, on the oaks, um, but most feed on a variety of genera. And, you know, so you may ask yourself, why do I want to plant for these guys? Why is this important? Um, and that last bullet there gives us the reason. Um, it, it's definitely easier to understand why we would want to plant um, milkweed for 
monarchs or why we would want to, you know, attract the IO moth maybe to our yard, but um, you may feel a little bit indifferent uh, about whether or not you have these little brown moths in your landscape. Um, but we need these guys too. And that's because of that interdependency of nature because of the host plant relationship that makes oaks bird food factories. So we're, we're definitely not indifferent to whether we have songbirds in our spaces. And the keystone plants and the caterpillars that they support are critical for songbirds. As we talked about before, 96% of terrestrial, uh, meaning not seabird species, feed their babies insects, not berries, not seeds, even the birds that we commonly think of as being uh, predominantly seed eaters. They're not feeding the babies the same things the adults eat, just like us. They need baby food um, and they need something that's high fat, high protein, soft, easily digestible. Caterpillars are the perfect food for this. They're basically like a baby bird power bar and they eat a lot of them. You may have heard the statistic. So 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars are needed to fledge uh, as in raised from egg to leaving the nest. One nest full, one clutch of black cap chickadees. That's a pretty small bird. So if you kind of extrapolate that by the number of nests that might be just in your neighborhood or think about larger bird species and you start to see that we need a lot of caterpillars in order to support the birds. Unfortunately, so far, we're headed in the opposite direction. The population of North American birds has declined by 30 percent since 1970. That's three billion birds just gone. At the same time, we're filling our yards with plants that are completely unrecognizable to insects. Since colonization began, humans have introduced over 3,000 plant species to North America, and most of them are inedible. Lepidoptera are not laying their eggs on them. They're not supporting caterpillars. They're not a source of baby bird food. Planting keystone species is the only way that we reverse this trend. In addition to their host plant role in feeding caterpillars and by extension the birds, you have oaks providing food in other ways. So um, acorns obviously uh, are part of the answer here and um, they're eaten by over 100 species of vertebrates including turkeys, the blue jay here, um, woodpeckers, squirrels, foxes, and even flying squirrels. The photo on the left there is a flying squirrel. Did you know that we had flying squirrels around? We have flying squirrels in the Kansas City area and oaks provide both food and shelter for them. Oaks also provide food and shelter and protection in ways that we don't normally think of. Um, so I want to introduce you here to the oak apple gall. Um, this is another really interesting host plant uh, relationship, but it doesn't involve a butterfly or a moth. Um, these structures uh, are created by the oak apple gall wasp, um, just a, a tiny non-aggressive wasp, um, not harmful to humans, um, and it lays its eggs in the tissue of oak leaves. And this causes a reaction within the leaf where it basically grows this ball of leaf tissue around the developing egg and larva and protects the tiny little baby wasp in there. Um, these aren't harmful to the tree, uh, and these, um, these pictures are enlarged. So, um, if you're, you know, just looking at a tree, this isn't going to be something that you'll notice, uh, not unsightly, uh, or anything like that. Um, but just, this is another one of those ways in which the oak species are supporting insects, which are later eaten by other things. So we have titmice, um, blue jays, nuthatches will drill into these galls and eat the little wasp larva. Um, the adult wasps are food for a variety of birds as well. As well. Um, so just like a lot of the things that oaks grow, many of them are ending up right here in the mouths of the baby birds. We definitely want to see that. So moving to our second genus that we're going to talk about today, um, we'll talk about the plums. Um, the genus name for plums is Prunus. Um, we have fewer total species here than we saw with the oaks, approximately 20 that are native to North America. The leaves do tend to be avoided by deer and other herbivores. So if you're looking for deer resistant uh, species, this may be one to look into. And these are really lovely landscape additions. They have flowers in spring. They provide food for both humans and wildlife in the form of their fruit in the summer. As a keystone group, Prunus supports many generalist species of native pollinators. Um, there are no specialist pollinators of Prunus, um, but it is a really important genus for a lot of generalists during the spring months. 
Um, it is a powerhouse when it comes to supporting caterpillars, though. Again, we have locally over 200 species that rely on cherries and plums as a host plant, second only to the oaks. Uh, one of my favorite uh, species that hosts on prunus is the red spotted purple butterfly. Um, you may be asking yourself, it doesn't seem to be red, nor is it purple. It is a little bit spotted though, so we've got one out of three. Uh, the adult coloration here is the a mimic of the toxic pipe vine swallowtail, uh, which helps protect them, though they themselves are not actually actually toxic to predators. So again, taking a look at the life cycle here, the female lays hundreds of eggs. Each one is laid just at the very tip of the leaf. Um, and then the caterpillar eats the leaves in a very particular way. It eats away the leaf, leaving the center vein, and then it perches out on that vein while it's not eating, um, just looking like some little bit of leaf damage or something. That's the young caterpillar there in the third photo at the top right, um, very well ca camouflaged. Um, and then as it gets to a little bit bigger instar, they employ a different kind of camouflage, as you can see in the bottom left photo. They look quite a bit like bird droppings. Um, and, and this is where I think the species gets really interesting. Um, if you can see the sort of white saddle-like marking on the back of that caterpillar, that spot measures the length of the daylight. Now, why would a caterpillar need to measure daylight? So red spotted purples have two generations per year. So you have one group of caterpillars that completes metamorphosis, makes a chrysalis, emerges as an adult. And the second later group of caterpillars, um, has a problem though. Fall is coming, winter is coming, and measuring the length of the daylight lets the caterpillar know whether it should form its chrysalis, that photo there in the bottom middle, or if it needs to spend the winter as a caterpillar. So as the days get shorter, caterpillars start to build hibernaculum. Um, that's the structure at the bottom right there. Um, it eats away almost all of the leaf, reinforces the connection of the leaf to the stem, and it rolls a little tube of leaf and it crawls in there and it spends the winter in there. They're actually able to decrease the amount of water in their bodies by over 50% so that they don't freeze. Um, they suspend their metabolism and all their internal systems. And then when the weather warms up again, they will come out, they'll continue eating and become the first group of adult butterflies for the next year. So really just an incredibly interesting life cycle, um, all of which is happening here on the Prunus genus. Um, and just like before, only a few of the hundreds of eggs laid are going to make it to adulthood. Another really interesting species that hosts on Prunus is the Cecropia moth. This is the largest moth native to North America. If you held out your hand with the fingers outstretched, that's about the size of its wingspan, about six inches tip to tip. Um, this is the male on the left and the female on the right. Um, they're generally just active at night and they don't feed as adults. They live for several days just to mate and lay eggs. Um, and the males have those very feathery antenna. That's the way that you can tell them apart. Um, they use those to find the females up to a mile away. So another life cycle spread. Um, again, the um, eggs are laid in groups, just like the Iomans are. They spend the early instars uh, of the caterpillars are spent gregariously living and feeding in groups, um, and they become more solitary as they grow. They also go through some really fantastic color changes um, until they look like the photo in the bottom middle there. Um, this caterpillar has eaten its fill and is about ready to form a cocoon, which you can see in the final photo. Um, it's contained within that webbing of silk, which is wrapped around sticks or dead leaves. And again, if you were not aware that these were in the landscape, this might be something you would just, you know, break up and throw away and you would not have either these beautiful moths or the wildlife that they support. So we have all kinds of caterpillars and moths and butterflies that feed on the leaves of Prunus, um, but this genus also produces fruit enjoyed by larger creatures, including us. Um, the genus has chokeberry, wild plums, black cherry, all of which are edible for both humans, um, birds, and small mammals. If you're a birder and you'd like to see cedar waxwings, yellow-billed cuckoos, uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks, or tanagers, um, all of these birds are attracted to this genus. So you might consider planting something from the Prunus genus. Prunus is also a great species for all kinds of little galls, uh, particularly on black cherry. Uh, on the left here is the gall formed by the black cherry leaf gall mite. 
And so she lays her eggs in the leaves of the black cherry tree. And again, the um, reaction of the leaf is to form this kind of protective growth. Um, and the larva is in there. Um, again, this is uh, enlarged several times. You wouldn't really even notice these from several steps away from the tree. So it's not um, something you know that your neighbors are going to complain about or anything like that. Um, the mite itself is microscopic, not harmful to humans, doesn't really harm the tree. Um, and as we've discussed, everything is hitched to everything else. So the photo on the right here is a butterfly called the cherry gall azure butterfly. So this is the female. She lays her eggs directly on the gall and the caterpillar of this species feeds on the cherry galls and the mites that are inside there. So um, these are also, they're present in the Kansas City area. And I, I just think it's really cool to think about, you know, who knew that all of these fascinating little wild things were happening just right under our noses. And while I don't expect that many of you are gonna rush right out and plant a black cherry tree to support the black cherry leaf gall mite, and maybe not even to support the cherry gall azure, but, I think it's important to remember that the mites and the caterpillars that eat the mites and all of these little tiny invertebrates that are feeding on the tree, so many of them are ending up here once again. And we really do want to support the full breadth of our ecosystems in order to keep them healthy. So finally, we're gonna turn to our last example group, um, the golden rods or Solidago. We have over 100 species native to North America here, um, about 20 to 30 uh, present in the Midwest. Quite a few of these are available um, commercially for your garden or landscape. The vast majority are perennial. Um, there are a few annual species uh, in the golden rods. They are great for late season interest. So depending on the species, we're starting the bloom in October, or in August, excuse me, on through October. They are mainly associated with prairies and prairie influenced woodlands or glades, but there are some shade species. And we do have a couple of species to watch out for that can be aggressive and quite large and um, out of place in the home landscape. And I think for some folks, these few plants have given the genus kind of a bad name, but most are really well behaved uh, in the garden. Um, and I'll have some information in the resources uh, about um, some preferred garden species uh, that should be easily available um, and perform quite well in the in the home landscape. Another reason goldenrods can sometimes get a bad rap is because people associate them with hay fever. Um, hay fever is most generally caused by ragweed, but ragweeds bloom at the same time as goldenrods. Um, so you're noticing this showy flower and you're just you know miserable with allergies and the tendency is to connect those two things. Um, but in general, if you're noticing a showy flower, um, that's because it is showy to attract insect pollinators. And plants that need insect pollination rarely bother our allergies because the pollen stays on the flower waiting for the insect to come. So the real allergy aggravators tend to be wind pollinated because they have just tiny, tiny pollen that's easy to float around on the, on the wind, easy to bring into our nasal passages um, and, and cause us lots of misery uh, if you're someone who suffers from that. So hopefully if you've previously thought yourself to be allergic to goldenrods, you might consider the alternative culprit um, of ragweed. Um, and we really need to appreciate this genus and to plant more of it. So as a keystone group, the specialist pollinators are really important with the goldenrods. Um, Solidago has 56 specialist pollinators in the Great Plains region, um, and many generalists rely on it for food as well. Um, so for Lepidoptera caterpillars, we have a solid 104 species in North America, um, over 70 of those locally relying on goldenrod as part of their food source. One really fun species I'd like to talk about is the wavy lined emerald moth. Its caterpillar is sometimes referred to as the camouflage looper because they decorate themselves with bits of the plant as camouflage. So there is one caterpillar in this photo. You can see if you can locate it. The caterpillars are found on goldenrod, but also on coneflower, on blazing stars, mountain mint, and more. Um, and these are just so fun to find. So if you have kids in your life, take some time to go out and look for these and appreciate the wonderful, unique relationships that are happening in our landscapes. 
planting our keystone species gives us the opportunity to see and appreciate some of these things that we just wouldn't be able to otherwise. Uh, in the specialist pollinators of goldenrod, um, here are just a couple. We have the spine-shouldered cellophane bee and, uh, on the right there. And on the left is the hairy banded minor bee. Um, and don't worry, there will not be a quiz on those names. Uh, many, many generalist pollinators um, as well are coming to Soledago. We've got the bumblebees. We've got monarchs visiting goldenrod for nectar as they fly south in the fall as monarchs are passing through the Kansas City area on the way to the overwintering sites in Mexico. Um, this is the same time that our goldenrods are blooming here. So if you want to support monarchs, consider adding goldenrods to your garden, not just milkweed. The blue-winged wasp is a pollinator commonly found on goldenrod. Um, if you're not a wasp fan, please hear me out. I hope to change your mind on at least this one wasp. Um, so they're solitary, they're not aggressive or harmful to humans in any way. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying to pick one up, but other than that, um, you really have nothing to worry about here. They mainly feed on goldenrod and they're a predator of beetle grubs. So they especially go after Japanese beetles um, as well as June bugs and others. And the female digs a hole to find the underground beetle grub. And once she finds one, she attaches an egg to it. And that larva that hatches out of the egg will eat the grub. Um, so hopefully that will help to decrease the population of Japanese beetles in your yard. So if you struggle with large numbers of Japanese beetles in the summertime, consider planting some goldenrod to attract this beneficial wasp to your garden. Next, we have the goldenrod soldier beetle. It also relies on goldenrod and benefits from the camouflage uh, on the goldenrod flowers as they feed on the pollen and nectar. Um, as larvae, they prey on both ticks and aphids. So this is another species that you may wish to encourage and invite into your yard by planting the goldenrod that they rely on. We talked about galls in Quercus and we talked about galls in Prunus. Here are some Solidago galls, some goldenrod galls. These are formed by uh, the female goldenrod gall fly. She lays her eggs in the stem of the plant and that causes the reaction of the plant to swell up and become this kind of protective ball-like structure again. Um, and then that larva just hunkers down in to kind of munch on the plant material and wait for next year. They do overwinter uh, in that gall. So you can see that there on the right um, with several of them in the winter landscape. I think that's just really pretty. Um, but uh, even if you don't, you should know that this is a food source. So chickadees, woodpeckers, dark-eyed juncos uh, will all drill into these galls to find and eat the larva and have a source of fresh insect food during those winter months. So again, um, it may not necessarily for you be about providing habitat for the goldenrod gall fly, but rather for the things that feed on it. So if I didn't sell you on wasps, I'm going to try again with spiders. This is the goldenrod crab spider. Um, if you notice, this picture is uh, really zoomed in. So this is a pretty small little spider um, and they hunt on the blooms of flowers. They don't build webs. And so instead she will just sit on the flower and eat whatever she can manage to grab that will come to it. So flies, wasps, grasshoppers, um, the, the most fascinating thing to me about these little spiders is that they have the ability to change their coloration. So she can be either white or yellow, whichever camouflage is better uh, to the flower that she's hunting on. So um, if she was to go from yellow to white, it takes about five to six days to flush the proteins out of her system. Um, but if she wants to turn back to yellow, that takes her up to three weeks to build it back up. Um, so I think this is just really a striking little spider and it's fun to watch them hunt. One final goldenrod critter to talk about, this is the Amorpha borer beetle. The adults of this beetle are found on goldenrod flowers, obviously benefit from that camouflage. Um, the host plant is Amorpha fruticosa. So they lay their eggs in the stem of the indigo bush. Um, and they are completely dependent on that species for their host plant relationships. So they're found in areas where both the indigo bush and goldenrods are present. Um, and just another way that everything in nature is hitched to everything else 
So you surely won't be surprised to learn that there's a specific parasitic wasp that feeds on the larva of the borer beetle while it is in the stem of its host plant because everything is connected, everything is food for something else. So much of that food ends up right here in the mouths of our baby songbirds. I wanna wrap up for you with this quote from Doug Tallamy who says, a landscape without keystone genera will support 70 to 75% fewer caterpillar species than a landscape with keystone genera. Even though the keystoneless landscape may contain 95% of the native plant genera in the area. So that's sort of a dense quote, but basically, if you're making a list of every genus that is native to your area and you plant 95% of them, but you don't plant any of your keystone genera, that is a huge impact on the loss of caterpillar species, on the loss of baby bird food. These keystone species are really critical in forming that base layer of the food web that supports everything else. So really take a look at your landscape, take a look at the list of keystones for your area and add some keystone plants and see what happens in terms of the number of caterpillars, the number of pollinators, the number of butterflies, the number of songbirds that you're seeing in your landscape. If you need help figuring out which keystone groups may be best suited to your yard, you can contact the Nature Advisors Program by Deep Roots KC. It is a nature inspiration and consultation service. Um, and for a small fee, a knowledgeable volunteer will visit you and give you recommendations on how to improve the quality and health of your landscape. And the birds will thank you. And I thank you for joining us. Um, please tune in next time as we continue our native landscaping series. I want to give many thanks to Deep Roots KC, Mid-America Regional Council, and to the Health Forward Foundation for their support. If you want to learn more about what we've talked about today, check out the resources that accompany this video or reach out to the organizations listed on your screen. Oh my gosh, that was awesome. Um, I know I'm biased. I know I'm part of Deep Roots, but, and I know I watched, I watched this prior to today and I still love it and I still learned so much. Um, and I think I could watch it a third time and learn even more. So I'm going to go ahead and invite uh, my colleague, Chris Cardwell, to the virtual stage. And I hope uh, viewers, if you would please do us the honor of putting some questions in the Q&A. Um, and we're just going to have a conversation about keystone species and what we're doing in our native gardens this year. Hey, Chris, how are you? Hi, Sid. Doing great. That was wonderful. Um, so much dense information there. Um, no doubt. I really and a lot of. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's just just a a lot of fuel for thought for me. You know, you get to thinking, uh, and some great questions coming in already. Um, really pleased. I want to give a little shout out here. So pleased to see several of our nature advisor volunteer. Uh, consultants here in the audience today for such a really important topic. Um, and do you want to just dig straight in? I've, I've got a question from Kristen. Well, you know, before we dig in, can you tell our audience who or what the Nature Advisors Program is, since this is kind of your baby and uh, since it's relevant to the conversation? And then we'll dive into questions. Yeah, absolutely. We've been promoting Nature Advisors since spring of last year, and we're entering our second year of this program, kind of a groundbreaking program here in uh, Kansas City, um, and also in the audience today, Dan Pearson with St. Louis Audubon, whose Bringing Conservation Home program was the inspiration, and uh, uh, he's been a mentor for us, uh, so shout out to Dan. Um, Nature Advisors volunteers will uh, come to a property uh, of a resident, and one of the key things is first and foremost, identify keystone species in place on that property, uh, address invasive species, and then make suggestions on how to invite more wildlife and how to increase ecosystem value and biodiversity on your properties. So um, very much a great conversation to have and a one-to-one -one resource uh, that Deep Roots is so proud to provide. Yeah, thank you for that, for sharing that insight. Um, I, I sometimes get to join in on those consultations and there's so much fun. I love just seeing where people are at, um, kind of see where what what inspires them, what their goals are, and how they want to move forward, whether they are a DIYer or hiring out. So thank you for leading that the charge on that. 
Um, and um, before we jump into our questions, I do want to mention uh, to our audience, if you enjoyed today's presentation by Sarah Beyer, they will also be one of our concurrent speakers at Planet Native on February 15th and 16th. They will dive in uh, slightly deeper to Keystone species in regards to how to, how to design your own native garden utilizing Keystone species. So be sure to get your tickets. Um, we will put the, the website and the resources following today's show. All right, Chris, let's jump on in. You want to start with Kristen's question? Yeah, so from Kristen List, um, really good question that I often kind of go back and forth on, but within a genus, are there specific species that you know of, Sydney, uh, mm -hmm. or anybody in, in of, our, of our audience here, specific species within a genus that are more or less supportive for pollinators or Lepidoptera? Um, mm -hmm. Because again, a lot of these resources just say that a specialist group uh, will prefer a, a genus at large. I'm thinking specifically of milkweeds right. that we know monarchs tend to eat the entire plant of world milkweed because it's softer, it's easier to chew, or I would imagine it's easier to chew uh, versus common milkweed. And so there seems to be some kind of hierarchy within that genus. Do you know about within oaks yeah. or prunus? So I can, um, my, the, the insight I have is all based on my personal experience in the garden. So I just want to preface it with that. Um, I'm not a scientist by trade necessarily, but observations are really important in understanding the landscape. Um, so you're right, Chris, like for monarchs, as an example, world milkweed and marsh milkweed. Um, so that's Asclepius verticillata's world and Asclepius syriaca uh, or simulata rather is the marsh milkweed. Um, and those tend to be the preferred choice for monarchs, at least at the discovery center, what we observe. Um, and I think you're right. It may have to do with palatability, uh, toxicity levels. I've, uh, I have read that world milkweed has a higher level of toxins in them, which translates into the monarch caterpillar being uh, inedible. Now, Another thing I've observed, um, like Blazing Star, as an example, there's several different species of liatris, um, and it does seem that, uh, you know, I, I noticed pollinators love all the different kinds, but there's something about Eastern Blazing Star, liatris scariosa, um, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's timing. I don't know if it has uh, different or necessary nutrition for that time of year. Um, but I think it's important as gardeners and uh, nature enthusiasts for us to take note of those observations and garden with nature in that way. And uh, I love Mary Grinter's comment. Observation is a huge part of scientific evidence. Don't underplay your knowledge. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, it, it, it really, it's how I've learned um, about native plants and native gardening is just from experience and nerding out and reading things and learning from others. Yeah. Okay. One of the key anecdotes and, you know, to share one of my uh, anecdotes, my personal experience is that a lot of putting keystone species in our, or, or preserving keystone species in our, our residential landscapes is about our relationship to the landscape as, as well as the wildlife that we want to support. For example, I have a beautiful sweet gum tree in, in my property here, uh, the much beleaguered sweet gum that I love so sweet many gum. people and, and <laughs> in the wrong place at, at the wrong time. I'm, uh, you know, we've got, we just talked about the Whitman list. Putting a sweet gum tree in a right of way on a street is like, that is borderline eco-terrorism. I mean, you are just <laughs> creating havoc for that sidewalk, those driveways. But in my backyard, I know that it's a supporter of the Luna moth, uh, of the Cecropia moth, uh, some of the most beautiful Lepidoptera that overwinter in sweet gum leaf matter. And so in, in my yard, it's a, a perfect species, not for some places and not perhaps for people with, you know, mobility issues or, or things like that. So right place, right time, right species, mm -hmm. as well as then knowing that those specialists, the research indicates they favor a genus at large. And so Talamy would indicate um, density and diversity really should be our first priority. Mm -hmm. And um, 
then kind of secondarily thinking about mm, what's their pre preference, you know, do they right. prefer Wendy's cheeseburgers or, you know, McDonald's cheeseburgers? <laughs> well, I'm a Wendy's girl myself, but, but fair enough. And I think, I think that's a really great way to look at that. Um, I want to mention, uh, cause I'm seeing, I'm looking through the questions and seeing lots of, um, mention about certain keystone species. Um, we would like to suggest the National Wildlife Federation Keystone handout as a keystone of resources. Um, so we will include that in the in the uh, digital resource you'll receive following the show. Um, it has lots of recommendations for specific species uh, relevant to your region. Um, and I realize we're getting close to the end of time, uh, end of our time here for the webinar. I would like to answer maybe quickly two more questions, and then the ones we don't get to, uh, we will uh, get answers to you all in the email following the show. So, Chris, I'd love for you to um, pick another one for us to look at. Well, uh, leading into another topic that'll be uh, addressed in Planet Native, Pamela is asking what keystone plants grow successfully in containers. You've done some great work in that. I know I love to see picanthum, mountain mint in a in a container uh, garden, a beautiful, delicate, reasonably sized plant that just brings all the pollinators and, and uh, insects to the yard here. Um, some asters, maybe? What are some ideas? Just You know, you can do just about anything that has a fibrous root, um, but you do want to keep in mind the, the size of your pot, the shape of your pot. Um, I, I just, um, if you've, uh, subscribe to the Missouri Conservationist Magazine. I'm featured in an article there talking about right plant, right place, right pot. It's called Patio on the Prairie. <laughs> um, so there's more insight there. But yeah, I would say um, think about, again, similar things like sunlight, um, how often you'll water, how quickly that pot will dry out. Um, and then stick with maybe one plant per pot has been actually some feedback um, that I've gotten recently from friends, unless you have a huge pot. So more information can be found in that magazine, um, which I will include in the resources as well. Um, but let me uh, but let me just name a few off the top of my head that I love. Prickly pear, rock pink, great. That's a great dry, full sun species. Um, you can do columbine, you can do yarrow. That's great for shade. Um, I even recommend trying some uh, some of the plants from the Sweet 16 most likely to succeed plant list that, that experts uh, collaborated on with Deep Roots. Um, so there's there's just a lot of options out there, but taproot-based plants tend to be more difficult. Um, they don't like the constraint of that pot, the pots as much. Okay, and I think, let's see. I just want to touch on, I'm seeing some questions kind of about like true natives versus nativars and cultivars. And, you know, there's, there's still a lot of um, data to be revealed about how the uh, properties of plants are altered through uh, cultivation by changing those genetic traits. Um, but I would say if your goal is to support wildlife, sticking with the true natives is the best way possible. But I understand um, finding them can be difficult. So we'll be sure to also include a, uh, our list of uh, Kansas City and regional uh, native plant nurseries. Uh, a couple off the top of my head would be City Roots and So Wild in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and they have true natives. Um, but it, it just, it really depends um, on your goals. But I, I know it can be difficult to find them. You can also try starting some from seed in your own backyard. Uh, that is uh, a process that requires more time and patience, um, but it can be more affordable in the long run if uh, if that's your jam. And let's see, I think that's all we have time for today. Unless Chris, you have any final thoughts on that or anything else? Just one final thought going back to a lunch and learn from before um, about burning and in general prairie burning should be done to protect biodiversity, to protect those overwintering uh, Lepidoptera and insects, burning only about 30% of a, a land uh, or a burn unit uh, at a time helps to preserve the population of those um, specific parcels of land. Uh, if your landscape is small, perhaps, you know, limiting your burn regimen to one 
uh, one time every three to five years so that your population has time to rebound. Um, and more on that in the, the archived webinar on burn regiments that was just done in January. Thank you for that, Chris. I missed that question. And that's that's really important because people do ask, you know, well, if we're burning the, the the plant materials, then what happens to the insects? So it is about balance. It is about your goals. It's about <clears throat> listening to nature and working with it. Um, and there's lots of opportunities to learn more about these different practices through our upcoming webinars and Planet Native, of course. So please uh, tune in next month or rather later this month. <laughs> I'm already ahead of myself. We're in February, but tune in the third Thursday of this month for Native Plants at Noon. Otherwise, we will see you next time. Thank you so much, Chris, for your help today.